Welcome to episode three, Feeding Your Brain, of the Weekly County Schools Growing Our Future podcast. I'm Erica Moore, Communications Director for Weekly County Schools, and I'm excited to be joined here today with some special guests. We have Director of Schools, Jeff Couples, with us. Thanks for having us again. Thank you so much for being here. We have the Director of School Nutrition Program, Ms. Jamie Knott. Nice to be here. And we also have Miss Bethany Allen. She is our Director of Coordinated School Health for our district. Thanks for having me. We are excited to haul right into this very special topic that we know is important to uh, each and every one of our community members and especially our students and parents. So, Director Couples, when we're talking about feeding our brains, what, what are we talking about? Well, you know, it's kind of common sense, right? I mean, our whole purpose, uh, connection and growth, those values, well, we always start everything with purpose. So the most important thing we do every day is we educate uh, our students, a.k.a. we grow our future. I I was looking for a logo around here that had that on there, but, you know, we we travel around the county and we see row crops. You know, this morning I was out and they were uh, harvesting the corn. And so, you know, on our logo, those row crops are just a symbolism for what we really do in the school system in Weekly County, and that is grow our future. So um, when we talk about feeding our brain, one of the things that often kind of goes operates in the background kind of like your computer that operating system is our nutrition department and so we thought it was really important on episode three uh, to get uh, our nutrition department on the podcast and share out some information about what they do and how important it is and so you let out with um, the simple phrase you know feeding your brain so a lot of times I've used the phrase you know you, you have to learn to eat but you also eat to learn and so from a nutrition standpoint, from a diet standpoint, from a performance view, um, our nutrition is the base of that. You know, any expert's going to tell you uh, if you're trying to get your body in shape, just lifting weights or just running is not going to do it. The nutrition is the operating system that you, that you run through. So it's the same way when you're trying to learn, particularly new information. I mean, you think uh, what our kindergarten, first and second graders are doing in those early grades as far as encoding and phonics and learning how to read, that's a lot uh, for the brain. Now, it's easier when you're younger, but the nutrition's got to be there, too, in the foundation. So um, in order to perform academically, Mm -hmm. which is our true purpose as a school system, uh, we have to have proper nutrition, and that department is uh, just as important as any department. You know, nothing's more or less important than the other because it takes all of us to get to the finish line, to get that graduate that we're looking for uh, as far as growing our, our graduates. So specifically, uh, when you talk about nutrition program, um, what we've started last year as a, a pilot run last semester is something called CEP program. And um Miss Knott will get into that Mm -hmm. as far as how that works. But it's important for us in order to continue that program for our students to eat at school. And there's nothing wrong with bringing your lunch, but we also want to stress that point, and I'm sure she'll get into some of that uh, from the data side, that we also want those students eating. And it's real easy how we pull that off because the CEP is so important to our school system right now because our poverty level went up in the last year. Uh, You know, in the latest uh, county profile from TN.gov, we were 61st in poverty. And even though our academics went up, which really speaks to what our teachers and and the whole team is doing inside the schools, that gets harder and harder to do uh, when poverty continues to go up because with poverty can can also be food scarcity. And so even in a snow day, if I close schools, I know kids may not eat that day. And so our nutrition program is huge when it comes to feeding the brain, and yes, we're learning to eat, but we also want to eat to learn uh, in order for them to get their credits and become that graduate that we're looking for. So really and truly, it's the foundation of what we're doing. Um, and I'm going to read a statistic just to kind of start us off here. Um, according to the, the state, to the national data, on your math standardized test scores, they go up 17.5% if you just eat breakfast. Wow. You know, so that's almost a 20% increase in performance just by eating breakfast. And, I mean, you can go on and on with these facts, and I'm sure our experts who are here with us today will will give us plenty of those. But, like, that blows my mind, just something as simple as that. And when you financially look at that and say it's free, and now through the CEP program we can also say our lunch is free, I mean, it really is. It's a Mm -hmm. no-brainer. So it's an important process to becoming a better person and growing academically. So um, because of our poverty, what we do in nutrition is huge, uh, but also academically, uh, the value of that, uh, empty calories, you know, eating things that uh, 
uh, aren't good for you. And um, so anyway, I don't want to take too much away from what they're doing, but we want to learn to eat, sure, but we also want to eat to learn because that's our ultimate purpose. Wow. Some of the, the – some of the, that, that – St- the statistics can be really startling. It is. It'll wake you up. Really? Yeah. Miss um, Jamie, if you do want to kind of lead in, uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about your background as an educator and then maybe a, a rough or a high-level overview of our nutrition program in our school district? Okay. Um, so I guess my experiences go way back uh, to when I was in my 20s. <laughs> um, when I was in restaurant management, I did that for 11 years, um, and then I went back to school to be a teacher. Um, so I have a degree in child and family studies and a degree in family consumer science education. Um, I was a teacher for 12 years up until um, February when I took this position. And so uh, this position is perfect in that it uses all of my experiences, um, my education, my experiences from being in the classroom, Um, seeing the teacher side of um, all of this and then I'm also a parent um, and so the parent side of why um, the program is important and keeping the CEP program and making sure that the kids are fed and taken care of. Wow so uh, whenever we're talking about Weekly County Schools specifically what are some of the what's our demographic and talk a little bit about our schools uh, program. Well I mean poverty is high Um, like Mr. Couple said. Um, so just making sure that our kids um, have foods that they like. Um, the program does cover pre-K all the way up to high school. Um, you know, having technically 10 schools with nine kitchens um, can be a little daunting. Um, and making sure that they all are um, successful and um, feeding the students in their their particular schools. Um, one thing in particular I found interesting taking this job was that students in, say, Martin don't necessarily like the same foods as students like in Gleason um, <laughs> because students in Martin, they, they have more access to fast food restaurants and convenience stores and all of that, um, whereas students in Gleason may not. Um, and so their food choices are a little bit different. And so I I thought that that was pretty interesting. And then, um, so trying to come up with menus that everybody likes is, can be a lot sometimes, but. um, How many students do we serve? um, About 4,100. Wow. Yeah. That's uh, a daily. It's a lot of students. It is. (laughs) That's a daily task. It's a lot of bellies. Mm -hmm. You know, and the interesting thing too about that scenario is, Mm A lot of times we don't realize how much data the nutrition department's processing and making data-driven decisions based on Mm -hmm. their information. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's not even getting into state and federal guidelines and restrictions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, that's that's an interesting fact because, again, you know, since I've been working with the school system, we you know, every school is its own school. It's got its own culture, its own – it it is a true community Mm -hmm. school right down to what they eat. So Mm -hmm. that's that's a pretty interesting fact. Mm -hmm. He mentioned the CEP program, and mm-hmm. that what what exactly are we talking about with that? Okay, so that's the program uh, through the USDA um, that allows us to be able to provide the free breakfast and free lunch for our students. Um, the community has to be eligible based on, um, I guess, poverty level to some extent. Um, but once you are approved, um, which we have been approved, you are approved for four years. You don't have to stay in the program for four years. Um, so, at, you know, at the end of the year, we sit down and analyze all the information, um, and we don't have the numbers to keep it going, then we can leave the program. Now, that is not the goal um, at all. We want to keep it. Um, food is expensive. Um, mm-hmm. Parent, you know, families are struggling. Um, And so anything that we can do to take off some of that burden um, for the families in Weekly County, that's what we want to do. Um, And so keeping the CEP program, in my opinion, is vital. Um, In order to do that, the best thing that anybody can do is to make sure that your child is participating. Um, Go through the line. Get the lunch. Um, I'm working really hard to make sure that the menus are kid-friendly things that your kids want to eat um but that's the the main 
um, component to this is that we have to have participation. Mm. If students don't participate, if they're not going through that line, um, we can't afford to keep it, to be quite honest. Um, we are reimbursed from the USDA based on those those numbers, and we have to turn those numbers in monthly, um, and we have they have to be <laughs> accurate. Um, we can't just write down some you know random number. Um, they do they do check them, um, and that's part of the the record keeping that we have to um, to keep. Um, yeah. So free so. breakfast and lunch every day for our students. That is mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, that is incredible. Mm -hmm. As a parent also, I, I always have my mm -hmm. daughter, you're eating breakfast and lunch at school today <laughs> right. for sure. But right. let me ask you, what, what qualifies as a reimbursable meal? Okay, so with the USDA, um, and we'll just really focus on lunch, that's the biggest one. Um, you, We are required, okay, and this is where we get into some of the parts of it that, that we don't necessarily like because we want to feed all of our kids and we want to feed them the home cooked stuff that we make at our house, but we can't do that. So uh, we have to provide five components, which are milk, protein, um, the grain, the vegetables, and a fruit. However, for it to be a reimbursable meal, we only have to make sure that they choose three of those items and one of the three has to be a fruit or vegetable. So if the, on the menu it has, say, cheeseburger um, and a corn dog and french fries, baked beans, of course you have your milk, um, say a banana, and corn, your child only has to come through to pick three of the components. So a cheeseburger, for example, will have two components. You have your bun, that's your grain, and then you have the meat, which is the meat or meat alternative that we have to provide. So that's two. And then they have to have a fruit or vegetable. So if they come through the line and that's all that they have, we can count that. Hmm. Is that gonna be enough to fill up your child though? Right. And so that's where you need to have that conversation when you're, you know, if your child comes home and says, well, all I had was a cheeseburger and, and a banana, well, why? Because all of the other components were there Right, and so that's where my job gets a little tricky in making sure that all these components um, are things that your kids like. Um, and so they can have all of them, okay? <clears throat> they can have all five components. They come in, choose one entree, and they can have all of the sides, okay? Um, and then it gets a little tricky from there too because we do have serving sizes that we have to abide by. and. Um, those kind of things. And sometimes students say, well, I don't, I don't like the food. And I understand that. But we have to provide, um, like for example, the bun, it's gonna have to be whole grain. It has to be, I have no choice um, in that. 80% of the grains that we provide must be um, the whole grain. Um, and then of course, we can't add a bunch of salt and we can't add a bunch of butter and we can't, uh, you know, add a bunch of sugar and, and all of these things that we can do at home, we can't do that at the school. And so again, part of our uh, job is to find recipes that use other things, you know, garlic or some other herbs and spices and um, making things um, still healthy, but still taste good. Right. Um, and so we're working on that. So, yeah. So there, that probably requires a lot of uh, perpetual updates and, and making sure that you're mm -hmm. staying kind of up on the trends. Oh, oh yeah. They definitely communicate with us. Um, dates when, you know, certain criteria has to be met. Um, that we have a lot of meetings, a lot of emails that keep us um, up to date on all of that. But, um, yeah. So what? Why do you think breakfast, school breakfast and school lunch, you know, you hear of yesteryear, why, why, why does it get a bad rap? Let me give you an example, personal example. We incorporated um, buying like protein um, pancakes at our house um, instead of just the regular, you know, buttermilk, yummy, um, and sugar-free syrup. Now, I love sugar, okay? So for us to make that, commitment to do that, to cut out sugars, to try to make things healthier for us at our house, those things taste different. Mm. 
And so if you're not used to eating like this, then yeah, you're gonna complain about how things taste because <clears throat> it's not what you get from you know the drive-through. Um, but you gotta remember, going through the drive-through, they don't really care if it's healthy, okay? Whereas we do. Um, this stuff is definitely um, nutrient dense. It is high quality food. The, the fruits, the vegetables, they're fresh. Um, and oftentimes uh, and they're local, right? That's, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Um, like just <clears throat> what, last week and the week before, I believe, I mean, we offered um, melon from Bell's Farm down over in Gleason. Um, he'll call and keep us up to date with what he has and what he can provide. Um, he gets watermelon sometimes and strawberries, and um, we've bought lettuce from farms and just different things that we can get locally. We also get lettuce, like, um, from our... Um, FFA um, over here at Dresden High School and at Westview um, as they are able to grow it then we will purchase it for them um, and just a shout out for them I know that especially um, Dresden High School they're wanting to get um, more greenhouses and stuff so that they can provide more for us I know Bell Farms I you know I just um, wrote a letter for him he's trying to get a grant so that he can get more um, greenhouse Grease so that he can provide more for us as well. And so, you know, there's there's things local that we can do and um, places that we can purchase, and we do that um, when we're when we're able to. That is so special. Uh, let me bring up one point too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Just reading over some content for this podcast, mm -hmm. is it true? Because being in a in an agricultural county, you know, a big part of our uh, economy. Mm -hmm. One thing I read was through the USDA, all of our food lunch programs across the nation, but particularly in mm -hmm. Tennessee, are 100% U.S. agriculture. So we're, by, by eating at school, you're, you're essentially funding our economy because mm -hmm. agriculture is such a big part of, of Weekly County. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So, I mean, are you finding that to be true as far as? For, okay, so we are, because we do take federal funds, um, we have to keep up. It's there's a buy American form that we have to keep up with, and um, we are required to buy American right here in the United States. Um, obviously, they want us to buy as local as we can, but if it's here in the United States, then obviously you know we can purchase it. Now there are a list of products that if that we don't have here in the United States, we don't grow them, um, and so we can purchase those, but they're on a list like they've been okayed, I guess. Um, so, like, say bananas, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we're obviously not going to drop bananas. <laughs> uh, too many kids love them. I love bananas. Uh, but, you know, if you can buy it local, if you can buy it um, here, in the, here in the United States, then that's what you're required to do. But all that's vetted through USDA? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we work with our distributors to keep up with that. And they know we have to do it, too. So from a, a budgetary standpoint... You know, one thing when we're we're building our budget, we're expecting the nutrition program to be essentially what we call revenue neutral, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to fund itself and operate on itself. Right. So the meal counts are important, but one thing uh, that I think our county would like to know, if a student goes up and they go through the line and they get a reimbursable meal, mm -hmm. are we reimbursed one-to-one? -one? No. No. So it takes actually more meals than per se what we need in order to cover the cost of the program mm -hmm. okay. so and that's something that um again i don't have control over this is um when we go and um reevaluate every year they do look at um our direct certified students so students that are um on food stamps or get medicaid and um other kind of social um, factors that are qualified qualify right. as they call them yeah. so um so for us for example for this year we're at an 80.11 percent that we'll get the full benefit so for like a lunch right now the full benefit is four dollars and 54 cents that's what we get for that um, student um on the other side of that because uh, we have to get to 100 percent right so 19.89 percent of the meals that we served we only get um, 53 cents and now that's for lunch for breakfast um, on the higher end of that we have two dollars and 84 cents and then 39 cents on the low end so um, it is definitely a numbers game and it's something we have to keep up with you know when we were looking at the budget this past go around for this budget year mm -hmm. 
and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our food line was over by $400,000. So you think about what the cost of food, you know, that's one thing that's not leveled at all. Mm. Uh, just go out to eat and you'll know, right. um, or buy groceries and you'll know. And so it's mm. the same thing, even though we're buying in bulk, it, the food cost is still crazy high. Uh, that is a problem. So for this program to continue and be a benefit for our students, that's why that meal count Mm-hmm. Uh, again, and if you if you bring your lunch, uh, you know I've got a son that plays football, and I'm like, you know, I know you're high protein mm-hmm. and high calories because you know you're trying to stay bulked up to to play your position. So you're not going to get all that maybe if you carry your lunch, but go up there and get you that cheeseburger you mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, and get that apple, and then we we're good and you're good, and it's a win win situation mm-hmm. uh, because again, it's at no cost. So we want to continue to do that uh, most we can. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. Yep. You know, I've um, I think that. It, through this conversation, I'm finding that we are. V- it's very clear that there is this correlation to nutrition and student success. But um, I think hydration is is really also something that we need to discuss, and ha- it's a big part of this piece that we're talking about. Right. And we have Miss Bethany Allen, who is a um, our coordinated school health program director. If do you mind to speak to sure. us a little bit about uh, hydration and how it all kind of fits together with what we're talking about? Sure. So, I mean, we know how important it is for our students and staff to be hydrated. And so um, one thing we were able to do is to add um, hydration stations to all of our campuses. And so everyone has access to drinking water and to refilling their water bottles that they can bring with them. And so if they're doing that throughout the day, then we know academically they're going to be set up for a better success when they're staying hydrated. Mm. Right. So we also have, it's it's August. It's August in West yes. Tennessee. It is hot here. It's very September hot. now. September. Yes, oh, that's right. It September. It's September. I'm sorry. It's September. And you know what? Quick. <laughs> it is. It's falling by. But, you know, we have student athletes yes. in all different schools. Like every one of our schools um, in a million sports and programs that are out, outside. How are they staying hydrated? So, and we really encourage um, our students to drink water throughout the day because if they can drink their water throughout their day, then they're going to be hydrated when they're getting to practice um, and doing that. But also, I mean, we are able to add those hydration stations in field houses and near the gyms and things like that to encourage those athletes to continue um, to fill those water bottles and drink that. And so we're encouraging that instead of our sugary drinks and Cokes and things like that because we just know this is better for them. Mm-hmm. And so what is the protocol on bringing bottles and water to school? So in our student wellness policy, um, it does state that students will be allowed to bring and carry approved water bottles filled only with water throughout the school day. And so that looks a little bit different in every school, um, but that's at minimum. So we want students to be able to have that water with them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, based on that age, some students, you know, the littles, they might not be able to keep it on their desk, but they keep it in their cubby and they can get a water when they need it. Um, And so, but with our high school students, especially being able to carry that water with them because we know when you're thirsty you're already dehydrated Mm -hmm. so um, just making sure we're staying on top of that that is so important is there is there anything um, that we didn't mention about water that we really need to kind of think about while she's in think mode there I would also say um, when it comes to those to the water bottles obviously we want them to have them but you know, we're wanting clear water bottles. Yes. Um, and so that's just, a, um, you know, generally a school rule just for safety sake. Um, you know, and, and going back to when it comes to staying hydrated as, part, as, far, as far as your overall nutrition scheme is, I think a lot of times, you know, as a former principal and administrator, you know, we're, we're trying to find vape pens and uh, THC and, you know, all these things because we're like, we, you know, in terms of absenteeism, we cannot teach them if they're not there, mm-hmm. and we cannot teach and learn if we're impaired. But the thing that, uh, again, just going through some research uh, going into this, just for my own learning, is you know, I really didn't realize if you're just 1% dehydrated, you think 1%, you know, and last week we were hitting 100 degrees almost every day. So if you're 1% dehydrated, you're already going to show signs of cognitive impairment. Um, and when it hits up to 5%, you can't do basic math in some cases with, that, that, that they have shown in some of these studies. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty telling how important it is. You know, if you can go up 20% on, your, on, a, on a standardized test just by eating breakfast and just by staying hydrated in order to maintain co- you know, cognitive ability, fine motor skills, et cetera, 
That's a, that's a big takeaway, I think, when you talk about nutrition. And one thing I can add is if a student goes to see a school nurse, the first thing that nurse is going to say, especially in the morning, have you eaten breakfast? Have you had water? Because mm -hmm. we know when we're seeing headaches, stomach aches, things like that, we, can, we have a solution. We have free breakfast. We have water access. So that's the number one thing they'll do. And once that student has done that, they can return if there's still issues. But we want to make sure those things are taken care of first. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great, I mean, that's a great point. So school nutrition, final thoughts, <laughs> takeaway? Well, for me, is uh, it's there and it's available. You know, that's not even getting into the social aspects. Uh, you know, there's a reason we break bread and we go to dinner and all those things. Um, so, I mean, you can, um, you know, we're trying to keep our podcast generally within a time frame, but uh, uh, this is a long conversation about nutrition. And um, I think when you look at uh, nutrition in America, it's not at a good place right now. Yeah, there's a gym on every corner. It's kind of like, you know, um, and, and memberships go up at you know on New Year's Eve, and everybody's got those uh, New Year's resolutions. But then following through on this stuff. But um, in, a, in a situation like this, if you're trying to eat healthy, our nutrition department's already got that planned out. Mm. You know, yeah, some of that's mandated because of the restrictions that we get in order to serve. But like she said, it's it's nutrition rich, so you're not consuming empty calories. Okay. Um, so if you're out there trying to turn over that leaf and become a more healthy person and take care of your body i mean our nutrition program is already doing that for you because it's already laying out your meal plan um you know and i think some other things too just final thoughts is um miss knott's done a great job just kind of coming in and doing an analysis of the whole, pro whole program you know we brought in some consultants that we've got some grant money for uh, we're looking at things again budgetary items like how do we prevent waste how do we become more efficient in the prep area um, and even some more scratch cooking, mm -hmm. you know, where you do have that good old home cooked meal at school mm -hmm. yeah. other than at Thanksgiving, you yeah, know? Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think we're on a good, good plan, good direction. Um, but with this CEP program, finances are a key component of it. And, uh, you know, we really want our audience to know it's important to eat at school. I love that. Great point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. As always, you can find this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Join us next time for more insightful conversations on the Growing Our Future in Weekly County Schools podcast.